it's time for us to check back in with Sydney Sailor Farr and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. Chicken and dumplings. A favorite dish at church suppers and family reunions was chicken and dumplings. Pork, wild game, and chicken were the most commonly served meats. This dish can feed 50 people, or just a few. Many Appalachian cookbooks contain basic recipes for chicken and dumplings using various ingredients. No one knows when chicken and dumplings was first served in Appalachia, but it became a welcome dish in big city homes and mountain kitchens alike. Cooks varied the taste by using sherry, lemon peel, parsley, and pepper in stewing the chicken. Some added butter and chopped giblets as well as boiled eggs to enrich the broth. There were two kinds of dumplings, fluffy round balls and slick dumplings rolled out flat and cut into strips. Up until the 1950s, mountain people lived closer to pioneer times than did their city cousins. They dressed chickens and made dumplings the way their mamas and grandmas had always done, still using wood-burning stoves and cast iron cook wire. In my childhood, Mama filled her cast iron tea kettle with water to heat on the cook stove, then caught a chicken, usually a hen. She killed the chicken either by wringing its neck or chopping off its head. She then put it in a number two size galvanized tub. Picking up the bull and tea kettle, she walked outside to the tub and poured water over the chicken. After the hot water loosened the feathers, she plucked and saved them for pillows and feather beds. Mama then brought the chicken inside and held it over a flame in the stove to singe the remaining pin feathers and hairs. After Mama washed and dried the chicken, she cut it into serving pieces and boiled them in a cast iron kettle. When the chicken was fork tender, she removed the kettle from the fire to cool. After deboning the chicken, she put it back into the broth and moved the kettle back onto a hot part of the wood-burning stove. Then Mama made dumplings. Hers were always fluffy and tender. She shaped them into round balls and dropped them into the rich, boiling chicken broth where they cooked until they were waxy on the outside and fluffy and tender on the inside. Our family did not like flat dumplings. These had no baking powder and little shortening and were rolled and cut into strips like wide noodles when cooked. They were firm and bumpy. I believe that fluffy round dumplings are more old-fashioned, while flat dumplings are somehow more sophisticated. The preference for one version over another tends to run in families. I grew up believing my mama's dumplings were perfect. I knew I could never improve on her basic recipe, so I never tried. I no longer use a wood-burning stove or a cast iron tea kettle on which to heat water. I also buy chicken from the supermarket but I still shape dumplings by rolling a wad of dough with my hands and cooking them just the way she did. People rave about my chicken and dumplings almost as much as they did about Mama's. Dried Apple Stack Cake Mama's dried apple stack cake was a low-fat, non-sweetened, mini-layered cake. It was made with stiff, cookie-like dough flavored with ginger and sorghum molasses and a sweet, spiced apple filling. When served, the cake was tall, heavy, and moist. The dried apple stack cake was a favorite pioneer wedding cake. In the mountains, weddings were celebrated with inn fairs, where people gathered to party, dance, and eat potluck dishes. Because wedding cakes were so expensive, neighbor cooks brought cake layers to donate to the bride's family. The dough for the cake was rolled or pressed out into very thin layers and baked in cast iron skillets. The family of the bride cooked sweetened and spiced dried apples to spread between the layers of the cake. The number of layers in the wedding cake was a gauge of the bride's popularity. Sometimes there would be as many as 12 layers. The average was 7 or 8. Stack cake was also served at family reunions, church suppers, and other large gatherings. The dried apple stack cake is the most mountain of all cakes baked and served in southern Appalachia. The story goes that James Harrod, one of Kentucky's early pioneers and the founder of Harrodsburg, Kentucky, brought the stack cake recipe with him when he traveled the wilderness road to Kentucky. Whether this story is true or not, this cake has remained popular with mountain people. Wherever Appalachian people migrated to, Washington, Florida, or Arizona, for example, they took along recipes of their favorite version of old-fashioned stack cake. 
called by different names, dried apple stack cake, apple stack cake, Confederate old-fashioned stack cake, stack cake, and Kentucky Pioneer Wash Day cake, all had two constant ingredients, ginger and sweet sorghum molasses. While sorghum molasses was considered not suitable in most cake and pies because it was too heavy, it worked very well in the stack cake with the dried fruit and spices. Sometimes cooks vary the amount of sweetening by adding brown sugar to the sorghum molasses, one half cup of sugar to one third cup of molasses. The original method is a long, tedious process with the cake taking as much as three hours to assemble. Some cooks just use regular cake layers and plain applesauce or apple butter or a combination of both as the fill in between the layers. While stack cake made this way may be tasty, there is no comparison between applesauce or apple butter and the strong apple flavor that dried apples give. One method of preserving foods in Appalachia was by air and sun drying. After coring and peeling, apples were cut in half, then in quarters. Each quarter was cut into two or three thin slices. When the apples were ready, they were spread on a large white cloth and placed on top of a shed or other flat area to be dried in the sun. A fine wire screen put over them kept out flies and bugs. This method was chancy because of cloudy skies and the chance of rain. Apple slices can also be dried near a wood-burning stove, in a sunny window, or in the oven at a low temperature. Stringing the slices with needle and stout thread and hanging them can also dry them. As they dry, the apple slices shrivel and turn brown. When completely dry, they are stored in cloth bags, glass cannon jars, or the freezer. Not many mountain families still dry fruit in this old-fashioned way, although they still love dried apples and dried green beans. They are more likely to use a dehydrator or barter with local florists for room in a greenhouse where they can spread out their apples and beans to dry. Although today's cooks may use different methods for drying fruit and different versions of stack cake can easily be found in recipe collections and cookbooks, mountain cooks still prefer the old-fashioned recipe for apple stack cake handed down for generations. Roasting ears. Mountain cooks have many ways to prepare corn, including roasting the ears and using the ground cornmeal. To roast corn, turn back the husks to expose the ear of corn, but do not break it loose from the ear. Inspect the corn for worms, bugs, or rotten spots. Clean away all the silk. Turn the husk back over the ear of corn and tie some of the husk ends together. Dip the corn into water to wet the husks so they will not burn. Place them on hot coals. Turn them once or twice during cooking. Leave them in the coals until they are tender. Then peel back the husk and eat the corn on the cob with salt and butter. Johnny Cakes and Hoe Cakes Granny Brock told me how Johnny Cakes got their name. The story goes that one time a little boy called Johnny was crying for his supper. His pioneer mother told him she'd fix him a little cake of cornbread and it would be Johnny's cake. She heated a bit of bacon grease in a skillet and spooned a mound of cornmeal dough into the skillet where it quickly spread into a pancake shape. Later, the thin, crisp corn cakes baked in a skillet or on a griddle on top of the hot stove came to be called Johnny Cakes. The early settlers in Appalachia often cooked bread at noon in the fields. Usually, the cornfields were high on a steep hill, a good walk from the house. If the corn needed to be hoed out quickly, the men would take their lunch with them, cooked vegetables and a piece of ham or shoulder meat, they would build a little fire and using a sharpened stick, broil the meat while baking their bread. Tradition says that these early settlers never bothered using skillets for the bread they cooked in the fields. They cleaned their hoe blades, made up the dough, and baked bread on their hoes. They called this kind of bread hoe cakes. When he was working, Dad would take along a cast iron skillet and a coffee pot. He would make a fire and put bread in the skillet and coffee and water into the pot. The aroma made even the weakest person feel glad to be there under the shade trees high up on the mountain. Gritted Cornbread When the corn is too hard for the table and too soft for the cow, Mama used to say it's just right for making gritted bread. This was a delicious way to prolong the season for eating wholesome garden-grown corn at the end of summer. 
First, you must have a homemade gritter with which to grate the raw corn kernels from the cob. To make a corn gritter, Dad would open a tin lard bucket at the seams and flatten it out until he had a piece of tin about 6 or 8 inches wide and 16 to 20 inches long. He used a number 10, medium size, nail to punch holes at close intervals over the surface of the tin. Then he would cut a flat one by 6 inch board, 24 inches long, and nail two 1 by 2 inch strips lengthwise along the edges. Then he stretched the piece of tin smooth side down across the board and nailed it to each strip. This left a space between the tin and the board for the gritted mill to slide down into a pan as the cob was raked across the gritter. Mama would bake the bread as she did any cornbread, yet it tasted wonderfully different. We love to eat gritted corn at the end of the growing season. Spoon bread. In 1996, I was invited to compile a cookbook of spoon bread recipes for the first spoon bread festival in Berea planned for the last week of September. I was pleased to hear of the plans to make this event an annual affair. I agreed to do the cookbook. People around the world bake and eat some kind of bread every day. Bread, they say, is the staff of life. In Appalachia, we ate hot bread three times a day, biscuits in the morning, cornbread for dinner in the middle of the day, and a pan of cornbread or a skillet of corn pone for supper. This routine might be varied for special times, such as when we had company. At times, our flour supply ran low and there was no money to buy more. Mama would use the flour very sparingly, keeping it for breakfast, biscuits, and cream gravy. She did not mix flour in with cornmeal when we were short, but made cornbread with bull and water. This gave the bread a completely different texture and taste soft and savory. Only later did I learn that bread made in this manner was called spoon bread. After I moved to Berea and experienced Boone Tavern's version of spoon bread, I had to admit that their spoon bread was richer than the kind Mama made back in the mountains. At an early age, I became fascinated with collecting as many different recipes as I could. It was a special delight to find copies of very old cookbooks and cookbooks put out by small organizations and churches. I discovered that some of these newer cookbooks contain recipes gleaned from much older cookbooks. The newer cookbooks always credited the name of the original group and the title of the old cookbook. In one old cookbook, the Cookbook of Southern Recipes, published by the Women's Club of Charlotte, North Carolina, in 1908, I found a recipe for mush bread, which has to be an early version of spoon bread. Sprinkle slowly half a pint of white cornmeal into a pint of hot milk. Cook until it's smooth mush. Take from the fire, add the yolks of four eggs, and then fold in the well-beaten whites. Turn into baking dish and bake in a quick oven for 30 minutes. Spoon bread resembles what you might call a cornbread souffle. It is the richest, lightest, and most delicious of all the cornmeal recipes I have ever tried. It makes a good accompaniment to country ham and red-eye gravy or any meat and gravy dish. It is a good match for seafood too and is wonderful with fresh garden vegetables, salads, and fruit dishes. As far as it can be determined, spoon bread probably originated in Virginia, perhaps with Mary Randolph in 1824. Some authorities maintain that spoon bread originated with the Indian porridge called sapon or sapon and consider that the true ancestral source of spoon bread. Others say that the butter, milk, and eggs which made spoon bread such a special dish probably were added after the Civil War. Spoon bread was most likely first made in Virginia, Maryland, the Carolinas, Kentucky, or Tennessee, but some say Virginia is most likely. The basic ingredients of spoon bread are very much the same from one recipe to another, the major difference being between those who use baking powder and or sugar and those who use neither. Blackberry dumplings. In the summertime, we look forward to fresh fruits and berries. Mama canned dozens of jars of blackberries every summer. She would use the canned berries to make a blackberry cobbler, or sometimes she just put them in a bowl for us to eat. Best of all was when she made blackberry dumplings. 
blackberry dumplings, one quart blackberries, hauled and washed, one half cup hot water, one cup sugar, a dash of salt, two cups sifted flour, four and one half teaspoons baking powder, one tablespoon sugar, one half teaspoon salt, and one cup of milk. Combine the berries, hot water, sugar, and salt and cook in a large kettle with a tight fitting lid over medium heat until boiling point is reached. Reduce heat and cook until the berries are tender. Sift together flour, baking powder, sugar, and salt. Put in enough milk to make a light dough. Drop dough by heaping teaspoons into simmering berries. Cover tightly and reduce heat to low. Cook for 13 to 15 minutes or until dumplings are done. Serve with cream. These dumplings will keep in the refrigerator for four or five days and will still taste fresh and look good when served warm. Spring greens. Wild salad is good for you, Granny Brock was fond of saying. It is rich in vitamins and it tones up the system. Granny always said you can find wild lettuce, pepper grass, sheep's tongue, poke, creases, and crow's foot in almost any field. She would add a basket of curly dock, dandelion leaves, watercress, wood sorrel, and a few wild onions chopped. The greens would then be doused with oil and vinegar dressing or smothered with red-eye gravy. Either way was delicious. In researching the subject, I found that most of the lore of wild salad came from the Indians. It is said that in addition to greens, they knew and ate over 200 different kinds of berries and fruit. One of their sweets was called service berry cake. They gathered the delicious edible red berries and pounded them into a paste. After pressing the paste into cakes, they dried them in the sun. They also made blackberry cakes in this manner. Early white settlers learned from the Indians how to do this and many other things. Many wild greens, however, like wild berries, were not safe to eat. Plants such as poison ivy, nightshade, and many more are poisonous. If you do not know wild greens, do not take a chance picking them yourself. Granny Brock and I would go into the hills and hunt lamb's quarters, woolen breeches, and what she called shoney. It takes land facing north to grow shoney. Dock is good, too, but you must pick it very young. There is yellow dock, narrow dock, and burdock. A favorite green was poke. It comes up early in April and must be eaten while the plants are young and tender. Poke was cooked and fried different ways by different cooks. I always thought the way my mama fixed poke was the best way of all. Gather poke shoots, cut them off above the ground because the roots are poison, and cook the leaves and stems together, parboiling two times and pouring off the water each time. Fill the kettle with fresh water the third time, add salt to taste, and cook until tender. Mix lard and butter half to half in an iron skillet, then add the cooked green poke and heat it again. Break three or four eggs over the top, adjust the amount to be cooked, and scrambled with the greens. To serve, pass white vinaigrette dressing if desired. Poke cooked this way tastes a bit like very good, very tender broccoli. Mountain morels. One of the treats of springtime in the mountains was when Dad found hickory chickens and brought them home. I asked him why he called them hickory chickens. I usually find them growing under hickory trees, he said, and the way your mama fixes them, they taste like chicken, only better. They have a proper name, I guess, but I don't know what it is. Later, when I went to college and researched the topic, the first thing I found out was that they are called morels. Finding out what I could about them was a pleasing job. Morels are conical honeycomb-like mushrooms that sit on fat stems with the cap and the stem a continuous piece. In Appalachia, besides being called hickory chickens, as my dad did, they are known as dry land fish, markles, and bigfoot. Morels are the easiest and safest mushrooms to hunt, but some say they have a dangerous look-alike, the helvella or beefsteak mushroom, easy to identify because it is squatty and thick with a brain-like head on a short stick stem. Morels grow in rich soil mixed with ashes in burned over ground and in old fence rows and orchards. They grow from an inch to a foot in high and are spread by spores. 
Cutting the stalk with a sharp knife is the best way to gather morels, as this does not damage the underground growth and enhances the likelihood that they will come back in the same place year after year. Dedicated hunters know when the time is right to gather them in Appalachia in April after a warm rain when blue violets are in bloom. As one moves north or at higher elevations, the morel season gets later even into early June. Hunters recommend that a person look for mushrooms while walking uphill because they will be at eye level and easier to see. Morels are cooked in a variety of ways by professional chefs. Appalachian people think the best way to prepare them is simply to drain them well and saute them in butter or bacon grease. I've been told one can freeze them, but doing so often makes them lose flavor. Drying morels and reconstituting them in a warm milk or water is a better option. Probably the best way to deal with a surplus is to invite your friends and neighbors for a mushroom feast. Shuck beans. In some states in the Appalachian region, dried green beans were called leather britches. In other areas, they were called shuck beans and shucky beans. Most people knew them as shuck beans, and dried green beans have been a traditional food from pioneer days. The Cherokee Indians cultivated beans long before the European settlers arrived in the early 1700s. Like maize, beans were nutritious and fairly easy to grow, particularly in the rich valley bottomlands in the mountains. For most Appalachian families, green beans served from the garden, canned, pickled, or dried became a staple food. In pioneer days, dried beans was a necessity, but people liked dried shuck beans so much that even today, some mountain families who raise beans dry them for winter eating. They crave the intense flavor of the dried shuck beans. Appalachian natives who migrate up north carry fond memories of dried beans and dried apples, and it is not unusual for boxes of dried beans or apples to be shipped to Phoenix, Detroit, Indianapolis, or Cleveland, where they are eagerly received by those who are homesick for the old-time cooking and traditions. In the Big Sandy region of southeastern Kentucky, some families would wait for the first deep snow to cook the first mass of shuck beans. This was an annual ritual for many generations. Favorite beans for drying were the Mountain White Half Runner, the Striped Cornfield Bean, and the Kentucky Wonder. A bean stringing was a popular social event in the first part of the 20th century, as were apple peelings, corn shuckings, and quilting bees. This was a way for neighbors to socialize even as they got needed work done. Word would go out to neighbors that a bean stringing would take place at a certain home on a certain date. Everyone was welcome to come. Family, friends, and acquaintances came from near and far. Someone might bring a guitar, fiddle, or banjo and provide music. The music provided entertainment for youngsters not old enough to string beans. They would frolic and play games while the music rang out. Many hands made short work of readying two or three bushels of green beans for canning or drying. There were two methods for drying beans. Neither method was used for shelly beans, which mature and start to dry on the vine before they are shelled. When the beans matured but the green pot was still edible, they were picked from the vines. Each end was broke off and the strings removed. A big darning needle was threaded with heavy thread. The needle was then carefully inserted between the two middle beans in the pod. It was like stringing popcorn for Christmas trees. When the string of beans was three or four foot long, the thread was knotted at the ends and the string hung on the porch rafters or on the walls behind the wood burning stove in the kitchen. The beans would slowly turn straw colored as they dried and shriveled up. After the beans were dry, they would be put into cloth sacks or glass jars for storage. A later method was to put the dry beans in the freezer to keep out the bugs and insects. The second way to prepare beans for drying was to break off the ends and strings from both sides, then break each pod into bite-sized pieces, usually between each bean in the pod. The bean pieces were then spread out on white cloths and put in a sunny place to dry. Many women preferred to break their beans before drying because they said it was easier to prepare the dried beans for cooking. It was for one thing almost impossible to pull out the threads after the strings of whole beans had dried. The best method for cooking dried beans is to soak them overnight in a kettle of water 
or put them in boiling water and soak them for an hour. Then rinse and cook them with a piece of smoked slab bacon for two hours or more until the beans are fork tender. When I was growing up on Stony Fork, families ate what they grew on the place or found in the hills. In the years before and during World War II, before the timber and coal companies came and stripped the land, the hills brought forth all kinds of berries. In addition, we had both orchard-grown and wild fruits such as apples, plums, grapes, persimmons, and pawpaws. There were fish in the creeks and wild game in the hills. Each little homestead had its cornfield, its patch of cane, and its beehives. Somewhere along the creek there would be a water mill where corn was ground into mill, and somewhere in the hillside thickets would be moonshine stills where corn liquor was bottled, sold, and drunk. In any culture, people's activities concerning food often reflect their social customs and beliefs. In our community, it was considered bad manners to eat a meal without inviting anyone who happened to be on the premises to eat with us. The invitation would be extended several times because it was not good manners for one to accept the first time offered. And the response, worded differently each time, made it perfectly clear to each party just what the result would be. They had to go through the ritual because it was the custom, the traditional thing to do. The ways of cooking and eating in Appalachia have changed. My son Bruce, who grew up in Berea, has never tasted birch sap or corn parched in an iron skillet or potatoes roasted in the hot ashes of a wood-burning fire. On the one hand, I'm sad that Bruce is missing so many of the things I took for granted as a child. On the other hand, I like my electric kitchen. Both Bruce and Wayne now can cook a meal in their own kitchens as well, and certainly in less time than I could in the kitchen on Stony Fork. Who can say the old-fashioned ways are the best? There is value in both old and new. So another fascinating, really delicious uh, look into the life of Sydney Sailor Far in this part that I read today. Uh, so wonderful to hear about all those foods. I like the, the end part there about the the manners, how it was important, tradition. It's still alive and well here that if somebody comes, you're going to ask them if they'd like a bite to eat, especially if you're eating, you're pretty much going to insist they sit down and eat with you. Uh, it reminds me of a story when Pap was a boy and they were living, uh, not here in Wilson Holler, but on down the road in Brasstown. He told me that at that time there was just him and his younger, the next brother down. Uh, his other brother and sister hadn't been born yet. And times were really hard and food was hard to come by. And there was a, a boy like 17, 18 years old in the community that was kind of um, kind of acted strange and just different. Maybe he had some, some um, learning disabilities or mental issues, and he just kind of wandered around. But Pap said he would often show up right at supper time. And because just like what Sidney was saying, Pap's father and mother would never turn him away. But at the same time, it really aggravated Pap's father because, you know, he was a big 17-year-old boy that maybe could be out working and, and earning what he, what he needed to eat. And he was taking food. Uh, Pap's father, Pap Wade thought from his family, you know, they barely had enough. And then a, a big growing boy sat down and ate most of what was on the table. And um, he was upset about it. But at the same time, he would never turn him away and tell him he couldn't have the food. Um, it's kind of a bittersweet story. Proud of Pap Wade for not turning someone away. But then you can understand, too, if your family didn't really have enough to eat, how hard that would be. So I liked that part. Um, all through the book, though, wonderful to think about those those wonderful foods that she mentioned. I start with chicken and dumplings. I love chicken and dumplings, and my family is one of the ones that likes the slicks. We like the little thin ones, not the puffy ones. So like she was saying, the dumplings um, kind of depends on your family, whether you like the slicks they're called or the more big, fluffy, puffy ones. Uh, I have a video about chicken and dumplings. If you've not seen it, I'll link to it below. Uh, the stack cake that she mentioned, such a delicious cake. I've made it often. Um, my Granny Gazzy made it, and by the time that I remember her making it, it was more like that applesauce cake that Sydney described. Now, when I first learned how to make it, I learned how to make it in a cooking class at um, here nearby at the folk school. And I've made them several times, many times since then. But I think the best one I've ever made was at Thanksgiving, this Thanksgiving. It was just perfect. It was so good. 
and I think it was because my apples that I dried were so good and and Sydney's really right when she points that out that you can get such a, a rich better flavor from dried apples than using fresh apples now it would still be good if you used fresh apples but drying apples, just like drying the beans that she talks about, leather britches, they're definitely called here. Something about drying something really kind of condenses and uh, makes the taste just so much richer. I don't know, it's something magical in that process. Um, but they are really good. And I love that she told the story about the wedding and how each person brought a, a layer. I've, I've heard that and read that in lots of places. And then I've also heard people say, no, that just really wasn't true. So I like to think it is true. And Sydney saying it's just one more reason that I that I, I would say I believe it. And I have a video about stack cake. If you've not seen it, I will link to it. Uh, Johnny Cakes, that whole little part about that, they're so good if you're in a hurry. We eat a lot of cornbread, but if we're in a hurry, then we're going to fry, um, fry some cornbread on top of the stove, uh, and it's so good like that. Mm, a piece of fried cornbread and some pepper jelly and a little bit of cream cheese maybe, that's, a, that's just a feast. And I also have a video about that I will link to. Gritted cornbread, I have a video about that. I'll link to that one. She's naming a lot of just the traditional foods. But gritted bread, I love it. It's really good. And I didn't really grow up eating it or anything, but many years ago on the Blind Pig and the Acorn, I was going to do a whole series, and I did, about corn, uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, I could link to some of that for you if, if you're interested. But gritted corn, that was something Pap had told me about. So we, made, we set out on this process of making gritted corn. Now, we made gritted corn with, just like she describes, corn roasting ears that you've got out of the garden. It's kind of getting a little hard and it's really good. I love it. But we also made, Pat made gritted corn for me out of parched corn. So corn that was totally dried and then we parched it in a frying pan and then we gritted that. Um, and that was a real process. And it was okay, but it was so chewy. I much prefer the, the fresh gritted bread for sure. And then the spoon bread that she talks about. I've had spoon bread, but I've never, I've never been one to really make it because I love that crunchy part of the cornbread. That's my favorite. Um, but, I, but her reading her words makes me want to think, well, I need to try spoon bread again. It's been a long time since I made it. Blackberry dumplings. I've, I've made them. I have a video about those, and they are so good. Such a taste of summer. Uh, those blackberries and the, and the bread, especially if you've got some vanilla ice cream to go on it. Mm, so good. Um, I enjoyed the little part about greens, those salad, those spring salad. That is such a, such a common thing in the mountains of Appalachia and in other places I know too. Now, I didn't grow up in a family that, that ate poke, um, what we would call it's poke salad, but poke is what you just hear people say. Granny didn't care for it and Pap didn't care for it. And Pap's words exactly were, I would only eat it if I had to, like when I was a child. I was something As long as there's something else to eat, I don't want to eat it. Now, he did love greens. He loved turnip greens and, um, you know, spinach and uh, even kale that I, I introduced him to later. He loved all those. But, but he just did not care for poke, and therefore we just didn't eat it much. I've eaten it with other people, cooked it with eggs like Sydney um, described, and I honestly would prefer, I'm like Pap and Granny, I would prefer the turnip greens or even collard greens, any of those. Uh, hunting the mushrooms, morels, lots of people here hunt them. I've never really been to hunt them. I, years ago, probably, I think it was actually just a few days before Pap died, we went on this massive hike up the creek really far, me and Matt and the girls, and that was the first time I ever seen one here. It was way up there, and it's funny she mentions that part about going up the steep bank so that they're eye level. That's it. I was climbing straight up, <laughs> straight up a steep ridge when I seen them. Uh, but I, and I, so I don't know much about hunting mushrooms. A few years ago, I did learn how to find chanterelles, a friend taught me, and I, I harvested them and discovered I have some growing out here, and I have some, there's some growing down by my brother's house near the creek. So that was wonderful to learn about that. The next thing she talked about was leather britches. I have a video about leather britches. Again, that wasn't something that I grew up eating. I learned about those later in life and I made them and uh, dried my own beans and I liked them. It's a totally different taste than green beans and some people really like them and some people don't. Uh, it's much richer, kind of a smokier flavor. Pap and Granny both preferred 
canned green beans so they canned all the green beans they that they when i was growing up they always had a garden and all the green beans were canned and that's what they preferred and matt and i mostly can our green beans too i do try to make some leather britches every year just so i can have a mess or two of them uh, but but it's just easier to put them in a can somehow. I don't know when you're in the process of it and you've got lots of beans. That's easier breaking them and stringing them and canning them, it seems like, than actually stringing them on the string. So if you enjoyed um, kind of all those food things, you need to check out Sydney Sailor Farr. She has a wonderful cookbook, More Than Moonshine, and all those things she talked about are in that cookbook. And she gives little tidbits of information about her life too. It's my favorite Appalachian cookbook. Um, I just love it. It's, I've made lots of the stuff in it and always been pleased, but I love the stories. She tells some really, really interesting stories just like she does in this book. Um, I liked kind of the very end there when she talks about there's good and bad, there's good in both, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, I love to talk about Appalachia, you know that. I love to look back at history and all that, but like Sydney, I'm thankful. I'm thankful I have a washer and dryer, that I'm not washing clothes at the creek. I'm definitely thankful I don't have an outhouse. So there's, there's lots of good, uh, of course, in our modern lives. And what I love is so many of those old ways, whether it's the cooking, the recipes she's sharing, the foods that she was talking about, or maybe the language or the traditions or the customs, especially growing your own food, all those things fit perfectly in our modern day lives. So, so I really love that. I'm not someone, I love to look back at the old days, but I'm not like mourning the, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm thankful that I have a, have a nice bathroom and it's easy for me to turn on the faucet and get water and, and to take a shower and all those things. Um, but, uh, I like that, that she said there's good in both. That, that really, really sums it up, I guess. So I hope you enjoyed this part about all the food. Please leave a comment with any anything that jumped out at you. Maybe some of those things that were your favorite or you've got good memories about. And as always, I hope you drop back by next Friday because we've got to see what happens next with Sydney Sailor Farr.